I want to change gears for a second and come back to this cortisol thing. Because I think this is a very misunderstood hormone. Um, and I know you've written sure. about this. And I think it's worth getting the listener up to speed on cortisol. Um, we tend to look at this very black and white. Um, so let's give the extremes. So there's something called an Addisonian crisis, right? Someone gets a bad infection. They have an injury to their adrenal gland. They can't make cortisol acutely. They're going to die. They are hands down going to die. The only way to rescue that patient is to give them massive doses of hydrocortisone or hydrocortisone equivalent. Um, and that very much speaks to the medical necessity of cortisol. Let's look at the other extreme. Uh, let's look at Cushing's disease. Uh, so you can have Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome where either at the pituitary gland or at the adrenal gland, rampant amounts of cortisol are made and nobody would dispute the pathology of that state. This is a person who develops um, uh, basically a ball of fat on the back of their neck that's basically the size of a basketball, excessive fat accumulation, um, all sorts of metabolic dysregulation. Again, nobody would dispute that that, that is a problem. Um, fortunately, very few people are in either of those states. So right. let's now talk about physiologic levels of cortisol and their impact on muscle protein synthesis and something you said earlier, which I found very interesting, which was uh, tolerating pain, pain threshold, training resilience and things like that. Yeah, so we have to think about the function of cortisol at its root, which is a stress hormone. Right, so you're, you're secreting hormone, so cortisol in response to some kind of stressor. Um, when it comes again, so this is this is a great example of acute versus chronic. Okay, when it comes to somebody who's getting very low sleep, um, overall unhealthy lifestyle, you know, smoke, whatever, they're going to have high levels of cortisol, and and that can be problematic from the or very like high levels of stress because now. Like think about what stress used to mean. Stress used to mean, oh crap, there's that thing that's gonna kill me, I need to run. And so your body would produce cortisol for a myriad of different reasons. A part of that was just a fuel mobilization response. It, it mobilizes glucose, free fatty acids, those sorts of things. Um, it's just trying to get as much fuel in the bloodstream as it can. Now, when, you, when it comes to uh, Cushing's, for example, because, or at least my best guess is, and there may be studies on this, I haven't looked super in detail on it. My best guess is it's not necessarily that you're accumulating fat, you're redistributing it, right? Like it's going to weird places. That's right. The legs become incredibly thin, the abdomen and the upper back become incredibly full. Right. So you actually see this in like um, people who have, uh, oh God, what do you call it? Um, why can't I think of the name? Um, Lipodistrophy. Oh, liposuction. Okay. Yeah. So your adipose doesn't just sit on nothing. It sits on the extracellular matrix. Um, if you do liposuction, it destroys that matrix. And so people go, oh, well, you can't gain fat back. You can't gain it back there. <laughs> but you start, if you regain it, you start gaining it in very odd places. And so what you're looking at is a redistribution because cortisol going back to cortisol, if you have high cortisol because you're stressed constantly and your your body is still operating on genes from, you know, a million years ago that's telling you we're stressed, must be something coming to kill us. <laughs> so we're going to liberate a bunch of energy into the bloodstream. Well, well, then it's still got, if you're not going to use it, if it doesn't get used, it's got to be put back somewhere, right? And so now you can have it started to be deposited in, in strange places possibly. Now, when it comes to exercise specifically, it's a stressor. Exercise is a stressor. It makes sense that it would increase your cortisol. Um, but people have kind of taken this say, well, we need to limit cortisol as much as possible. So remember, there used to be the old, I don't know if you remember this, but it was like, don't train more than an hour because at that point, cortisol starts to go up, starts to spike. I, I missed that entire memo and school of thought, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, so we've, we've referenced Stu Phillips a few times now. He did a study, I want to say 10 years ago, and looked at uh, different hormones and how they associated with actual hypertrophy. So he looked at, uh, uh, or sorry, so the post-exercise increases in systemic hormones. So he looked at testosterone, IGF-1, 
growth hormone, cortisol, um, and I think that was it. Guess which hormone was most cortisol, closely associated with hypertrophy? Cortisol, absolutely cortisol, hands down. But of course, I, I'm familiar with the paper, but yes. Uh, right. And, and yeah, the interpretation is, again, is it that cortisol is producing hypertrophy or is it cortisol is in response to the stress that is producing hypertrophy? So that's, again, this seems paradoxical because people see an association, they automatically think, well, there must be a cause there. Not necessarily at all. These two things are happening in parallel. So what it means is the resistance training uh, session that is going to produce the most amount of stress, the most amount of adaptation is probably going to produce the most cortisol and possibly the most hypertrophy if it's repeated, right? So cortisol, like we know that it will impede muscle protein synthesis, but again, that is cortisol acts transcriptionally like testosterone. It is actually a steroid hormone. In fact, people get confused because they're like, well, he got a steroid, steroid injection before his, you know, tennis match. And people are like, they're not, test, just, they're not injecting him with testosterone. They're giving him cortisol so he can go out and play because it reduces uh, inflammation in that particular area. Well, um, cortisol is more of a long-term hormone. It's acting transcriptionally. So it's what you need to be worried about are long-term low-level elevations in cortisol. And people make this mistake with anything. They make it with mTOR. A lot of the, the vegan doctors get all up in arms about mTOR, you know, getting stimulated by leucine and that's gonna give you cancer. You don't understand tissue specifics and you don't understand acute versus chronic. I just wanna make a funny comment there. I, I was at a, at a meeting and a very famous vegan doctor who I obviously won't name, um, came up to me and chastised me for the idea that I would ever suggest someone ingest five grams of leucine during a workout because of its negative effect on mTOR and how that could be bad for a person's health. And I just had to sit there and smile and see, I, I, I just don't have it in me sometimes to tell people to shut up. 